The views expressed on the CVS podcasts and the CVS webpage are solely those of the podcaster and those he has interviewed. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the VIE Catholic Radio nor the authoritative teaching of the Catholic Church. Hi, I'm Pope Michael, and you're listening to Catholic vs. Catholic. How should I address you? Your Holiness would be good. Okay, so Your Holiness, thank you very much for your taking the call. This is an amateur podcast. I'm a Roman Catholic. I'm faithful to the magisterium that's in the Vatican, Pope Francis. I don't know you. I don't know anything about you. And I, if I ever do or say anything disrespectful, just please stop me and just correct me, okay? That sounds great. Okay. So if you could just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you believe, and how you came to believe it. Okay. Uh, I was born David Bodden in 1959. I was raised a Catholic. Uh, in 1965, I was a victim of First Communion before First Confession. That was one of the experiments in the spirit of Vatican II, one that actually they repealed a few years later. And at that time, my mother, of course, became concerned and found that another bunch of parents had already gotten together and were teaching their children the catechism themselves rather than using the modernist ones that were coming out at the time. They were teaching from the old Baltimore catechism. So I was educated in the Catholic faith from the traditional catechism. But at the same time, this is when the changes were going on. They're changing from the uh, Tridentine Mass through the Mass of John the 23rd and eventually to the Novus Ordo. In any case, in 1972, my family, among others, decided that uh, we could no longer stay with the Novus Ordo or with the teachings that came out as a result of Vatican II, which do not square with the magisterium of the Church. And that's when we joined the traditionalist movement. In the 1970s, the uh, positions were not as clear-cut as they are today, because there was a lot we had not yet discovered. But everybody in the traditionalist movement was in practice a sati vacantis in the 70s. It was in the early 80s that the positions were finally made concrete. Archbishop Lefebvre took his position in favor of accepting the claim at the papacy at that time, uh, John Paul II, as Pope, but resisting his orders which that physician came to find out is uh, inconsistent with Catholic teaching. If John Paul II was Pope, then we should accept the Novus Ordo. We should accept everything that he was doing. I mean, we could object to uh, some of the minor things, uh, but still, the virtue of obedience is there. That's why many of us went on and became Sede Vicontis, because we could not square the teachings of Paul VI and John Paul II with the teachings of the Catholic faith. And that's how we got there. But at the same time, in the mid 80s, I discovered there was a substantial problem with the whole traditionalist movement. And that's when I became what has now come to be called the, a home alone. Are you familiar with that term? Well, basically it got that name because these Catholics stay home alone and avoid the administration of the traditionalist priests and bishops because we believe that they do not have authority from the church, which in fact, they themselves, with a couple of minor exceptions, admit that. The Society of St. Pius X admits it. I've seen on their website, the CMRI uh, with the Bishop Pivarunas, he admits it. Bishop Daniel Dolan was quoted in a book, The Spoke of Satan, saying, yes, we don't have ordinary authority in the church. So the traditionalists have no authority. And I went on from there and was confronted by the uh, teaching from what is called the First Vatican Council, I believe it's the only Vatican Council, that Peter will have perpetual successors in the papacy. So that's when I began, actually I joined a movement that had been running for about 15 years already to elect a pope. Started with the Father Saints Ariega in Mexico in the early 1970s. In fact, he and uh, two other priests visited personally with Archbishop Lefebvre on the election of the Pope. Now, your St. of Acontis, bishops uh, Piverunas, Dolan, Sanborn, etc., all descend from Bishop Peter Martin Yodin Tuk of Vietnam. He and his first bishops 
held several meetings discussing the election of a pope. What torpedoed that is the two American bishops at the time, Bishops Musi and Vesalis, who I knew personally, got into some argument with each other. What they got an argument over, I really don't know, because that's the time I was becoming home alone, and they, they split. When that split ended, it took bishops pursuing the election of a pope. Instead, they were just kept consecrating bishops, and that's why we have the State of Vicontis movement. In fact, the State of Vicontis movement is not truly united. I just found out yesterday Bishop Sanborn is planning on consecrating a Father Selway as bishop. So my first question is, what bishops are going to show up at that consecration? Since the consecration, I presume, will be in the United States, I would expect Bishop Pivarunas, Bishop Dolan, uh, and I've heard a mention of a Bishop Neville who lives near Bishop Sanborn. They all should be together at that consecration, two of them assisting Bishop Sanborn and third just in attendance to show their unity. What I find is they, even the state of a contest argue with each other. They have chapels in each other's territories, if you will, although according to the Catholic Church, they have no authority to operate. And that's, that's how I came to where I'm at, pursuing a papal election, and we contacted all the state of Acontis in the world that we could find. We had a list of all of the state of Acontis chapels throughout the world that was compiled in 1989. That's the list we used to contact concerning the papal election. Very few actually showed up at the election, although there's much discussion about it. the existence of Pope Michael today. I'm not quite sure why they're discussing that. In fact, there were two subsequent elections organized by people who were connected in some respect with the movement that led to my own election. They were all well aware of it. In 1994, Victor von Pence, who had been in a society, St. Pius X Seminary, he was elected pope. In fact, a couple of bishops even participated in that election. In 1998, you have a Father Earl Lucian Pulvermacher, uh, you might have heard of his brother, Father, Father Carl Pulvermacher, who worked on the Angelus Press forever. In any case, he had left the Novus Ordo the same time his brother did in about 1974-75. He worked for the Society of St. Pius X for about three months. He left them, and then he was an independent priest visiting people all over the country. Eventually, in 1998, he got a small group together who elected him as Pope. He's now subsequently died and left no successor. Victor von Pence, to the best of my knowledge, has virtually resigned. Last I heard, and this was years ago, because he was a bank guard in Northern England. Because that's where he's from. And then I've heard of a group that elected a, a pope in, what, about 2007, 2008, somewhere along in there, in South America. And there was a line of three claimants in that. The third one resigned. So that line has also died out. How, how do you approach sort of ecumenism and bringing people to the truth? How do you approach that? Basically, we're open to bring anyone into the church. And if you look at the website, you see our main thrust is not about proving the validity of the papacy. Yes, we have you know questions and answers, and we're working out to better present the case. But our main thrust is to educate people how to become saints, get them to pray, Take a look at St. Vincent Ferrer, who preached during the Western Schism. He didn't preach about who was Pope and who wasn't. He'd come to town and say, you've got to stop sinning. You've got to convert. You've got to live the Catholic way of life. And that's our main focus. But what do you say about people on the left, like the Catholics that are very lackadaisical about morality, sexual morality, abortion, contraception? How do you view those people? Because it's very rampant in my church today. You see, that's one of the problems that came out in the spirit of Vatican II. People came to be lax in both faith and morals. You can take a look online and see the statistics. How many believe in the real presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament? Well, to be Catholic, you have to believe that. If you don't believe that, you're a heretic. So that places you outside of the church. Okay, the same is true of abortion, birth control. I mean, the church's teaching is clear on these subjects. So if they're going to start rejecting any of the doctrines or morals of the Catholic Church, which go back to the time of Christ, 
they are rejecting Catholic Church. They are not Catholics. What was it about 1958? I'm assuming that that is sort of the date for you, like Pius XII was a legitimate pope in your understanding? Right. Angelo Roncalli, who became the second John XXIII in history, we believe the second anti-pope John XXIII, had committed public notorious heresy prior to his apparent election. Oh, what was that? Uh, he was weak on communism. He was weak on religious liberty, you know, praising other religions as a way to God. As Catholics, we believe outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. Now, we don't judge individuals and why they're outside the church. But objectively speaking, if you want to get to heaven, we believe you have to become a Catholic and live the Catholic way of life. And you need to submit to the Pope. Right, exactly. That's part of it, because that's an unum sanctum. That's a bit of a problem for the set of Vacantists. Well, see, they wipe it out by saying we have no Pope. So we are in a long interregnum, along with the history. And they, they've got one book that makes a statement that says that this is theoretically possible. I wish they read the rest of the book because it's actually quite a good book. Are you talking about Robert Bellarmine? No, it's not St. Robert Bellarmine because St. Robert Bellarmine doesn't talk about a long interregnum. I think St. Robert Bellarmine may have held the position that's not possible for the Pope to become a heretic. But then St. Robert Bellarmine in De Romano Pontifice takes every case of alleged papal heresy from the beginning up to his time and proves that none of them were actually heretics. He goes into the notorious case of Honorius, and et cetera. He goes into every alleged case of papal heresy and disproves them all. And anyone who mentions the possibility of papal heresy say, will say, this is only a theory. It has never happened in the history of the church. And then we get to the other proposition, which is why everyone now focuses on the 1958 date. Cum ex apostolatus officio, of Pope Paul IV states that a heretic cannot become Pope. And that's still in force today, because the 1917 Code of Canon Law did not consider the question of a heretic trying to gain an office in the church. So that Code of Canon Law says that there's no provision concerning something in the Code of Canon Law. You go back to the old law, the Max Apostolos Officio. In the case of a pope becoming a heretic, there's a question, can you judge the pope, can't you? There are a lot of questions about that. And that's what bugged me in the early 1980s until someone presented cum ex apostolos officio. I said, now we're considering not whether or not a pope became a heretic or can you judge the pope. We're considering not whether someone became pope in the first place when there is good reason to believe he didn't. And that's why everyone's focus is now in 1958 because they were discussing the other proposition in the late 1970s and into the 1980s. And so that society of St. Pius X brings up, you can't judge the Pope. Although Archbishop Lefebvre himself came very close to declaring the papacy vacant. I mean, he called John Paul II an antichrist. Are you familiar with the history of the Arian heresy? And were any of the popes tempted to embrace that heresy? No, none of the popes were attempted to embrace that heresy. That's Pope Honorius. He uh, was weak on punishing the Arian heretics. At most, it was weakness. Okay, this is the 4th century or 5th century or what? Somewhere in that area. Were there a lot of bishops that did embrace the Arian heresy? I would say a large number of bishops embraced the Arian heresy for a time. Until some few of the bishops came forward and said, hey, wait just a minute. Arius is wrong. Once they got in council, they realized we've been fooled. What's your impression about this sort of role of politics in the church? Unfortunately, politics has had all too much of an influence in the church when it should have none. We should be seeking only the will of God. Because if we all would try to conform ourselves completely to God's will, that would be the end of strife on earth if everybody on earth did that. And that's the message that needs to get out. It's not about uh, me versus this bishop over here or Pope Francis. It's about teaching people how to conform themselves to the will of God. And that's our major thrust here. When I speak to the set of the Kansists, they give me the distinct impression that I'm way too soft in my ecumenical approach to other religions. Because I, I interview not only Catholics that I disagree with, but Protestants, atheists, Muslims, Buddhists, Jews, and so on and so forth. And I have to admit that I'm touched 
by the love of God that I find in some of these people, not all, obviously. But there is a genuine love of God, I think, in a good Muslim or a good Jew or a good Protestant. What is your perspective on ecumenism and religious liberty? And am I too soft in my view of these wayward sheep? You might not be too soft in your view. They are trying to do good. Now, we still want them to conform to the will of God, which is ultimately their conversion. But if I come up to one of these people who I see some good in and say, you're going straight to hell, how much is he going to listen to me? He's not. No, I'm going to work from, okay, you're trying to do what you believe God wants you to do. Now, I do think you're wrong. If you would like to discuss it, here is where we differ, and here's why I believe what I believe. And that's what I did when I became convinced of, first, the home alone position. I wrote to all of my friends, which includes the traditionalist priests, and I told them, here's the position I'm taking, and here's why I'm taking it. And if you find any fault with my reasoning, I'd like to hear about it. No one got back to me and found fault with my reasoning. Now, the proposition on religious liberty is that not only do we as individuals have a duty to Almighty God, the state does as well. So the ideal state is a Catholic state where only the Catholic Church is promoted. The state can limit, you know, like the uh, building of churches by other religions. And the state cannot force someone to convert because a forced conversion is no conversion. It's worse than worthless because let's say I could force a Muslim to convert. Isn't it possible that he might work against the church? Whereas if I left him alone out there, he would not be an enemy of the church. So, but the state as well has a duty to Almighty God. What is the traditional interpretation of separation of church and state? I've never understood historically what happened in the development of that idea. Can you explain that to me? Okay. The Catholic position is that ideally the church and state should be united. The Catholic church with the Catholic state. That's the ideal situation. Separation of church and state came about first here in the United States because it was mainly Protestants that founded it. Most of them came over here because problems back home, especially in England, where there was an official church, but it wasn't their church, and they were persecuted. So we have all these different denominations. When they come together, it's like, we can't put any one of them in charge. So that's when they separated church and state. Uh, can you talk a little bit about Luther and that so-called Reformation? Just in overview, what's how, how would you characterize the man? Because I see him as an evil man, or at least a deluded and insane man. Certainly not a good man in his later life after he left the church. What's the truth about Luther from your perspective? Well, I was reading something many years ago. This is from a letter of his to someone, I forget who. But he's talking about all this work he has to do. You know, he's doing a commentary on St. Paul, and he's dealing with some squabble over a fish pond or something. All these things he has to do, he says, I don't have time to pray. And he had stopped making the time for prayer. He's like, get rid of the stupid fish pond. Let someone else deal with that squabble. Uh, you don't have to do a commentary on Paul right now. You don't have time. We have to get our prayer life in order first. And that's what led to his eventual departure from the faith. So yes, he was an evil man, but the evil was in his heart. And it was in there long before he left the church because he stopped putting first things first in his life. And that's the main thing we're wanting to preach. You've got to get your heart right with God. You've got to take and make time for prayer. You've got to take time to learn the faith. You've got to live the Catholic way of life by the commandments, be virtuous, etc. Because if you don't, you could become like Luther. I could become worse than Luther. And the second I forget that, I'm in trouble. Because I'm, I have to remember that without God's help, I can make Luther look like a saint. We have to remember who we are and come to God and say, God, you've got to keep me straight. And Luther failed to do that. And that's what 
led him to eventually start the Protestant revolt. I don't call it a reformation because it's not a reforming of anything. It's a formation, not a reformation. And the Catholic counter-reformation bore a lot of good fruit, no? Oh, it, it certainly did. That's the benefit that comes from heretics. Uh, true, it's a very great evil. But if we have the proper reaction okay, and fix what's wrong with us, because Luther, I haven't read his 95 Theses. I probably should. I know not all of them were condemned by the church. There were some things that needed work on, a lot of things. And this uh, brought it to light. Unfortunately, a lot of souls were lost in the process. But if it hadn't happened, a lot of different souls would have been lost. And by being recalled to their duty, you know, the bishops, the priests, and even the faithful became truly faithful again. Can you just talk briefly about some of your favorite heroes of the Catholic faith? Uh, one of the saints I like is St. John Hughes. Uh, he was around the early 1600s. In fact, he is the founder of the uh, devotions to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. He wrote a book on the Sacred Heart, and he wrote a book on the Immaculate Heart, both of which are in English translation. He also wrote a book, The Kingdom of Jesus and Christian Souls, which is a very good spiritual book. He's a very devout priest. He found the Eudist fathers. He was part of the continuation of the Counter-Reformation. You have St. John Eudes, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, St. Francis de Sales, St. Alphonsus. They were all encouraging people to live a spiritual life. In fact, St. Vincent de Paul especially called for a reformation in preaching. But I believe all four saints wrote on, I believe all f some of their writings are in English translation, on how priests should preach. Because St. Vincent de Paul said, we don't need flowery sermons that people forget before they even get out of the pew. We need sermons that strike the heart, that teach the people how to become saints. Because a lot of your preachers at that time they wanted to be, you know, well thought of. I don't care if I'm well thought of, as long as people are practicing what they should, and that's what I'm preaching. In fact, what we need to do, and this is where you come to the reform of the clergy, we have to practice what we preach. And a lot of us don't. And some of the best sermons that I may have preached are the ones I needed to hear, too. I needed to take to heart. That's that's what's important. So I've named off four saints there I like. What about popes? Pope St. Pius X, he, he really had it together because he foresaw what was coming. I mean, we all grew up in a modernist world. Our last really good crop of saints come from the mid-1800s. St. John Bosco, St. Joseph Cofaso, St. John Vianney, the Curie of Ars. St. Joseph Cofaso wrote a book on the priesthood, which has been translated. Then you can get a hold of St. John uh, Vianney's sermons. Then you come to the last crop of saints in the mid-1800s, and then we slid downhill, and there are not really many priests or people whose lives stand out. What did you think of St. Mother Teresa? She's been canonized by my church recently. Did you admire her, or did you think, like Christopher Hitchens, that she was a fraud? Actually, I think she was a fraud. I've seen some stuff that makes me question her sanctity. She, she was too ecumenical. She wanted to encourage a Muslim to become a better Muslim. Well, ideally, I want that Muslim to convert and become a Catholic. I'm going to be very careful how I deal with them. I'm not going to put pressure on them. But if I see an opening to bring the truth to them, that's part of our evangelization, which Vatican II kind of put on hold. Because they got ecumenical rather than evangelizing and converting the world. In fact, a lot of people have now conformed to the world. I fear for their salvation. And so, uh, have you reached out to the Vatican, this, well, I guess you would call it the Novus Ordo Church? Have you ever reached out, or have they ever contacted you? Are you even on their radar? Uh, I believe I'm on their radar. I've never reached out and had any formal contact since 1992 when I sent a letter into the Vatican 
to notify them of some of the various heresies of Vatican II. And I've discovered more since then. I haven't had any real connection, but I do know that they are aware of us. 1990, Kansas City Star called the Vatican when they did an article about my election. And the reply was no comment. Uh, when I had better site statistics way back, there was a visit from Vatican City State to the Vatican Exile website. So I, th- I believe they are aware of our existence, but they're trying to ignore us and hopefully just die out, you know, like Lions II, etc. These others have died out. Can you talk a little bit about the heresies that are being taught since Vatican II? Things that I take for granted as Catholic that you say are not Catholic, because I, I would be putting myself in danger if I'm believing heresy, no? Yes, you would be. Uh, one of the biggest ones is uh, their position concerning false religions, that they are actually means of grace to be found in false religion, which the Church does not teach. It's in several of the decrees. Uh, go onto the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops website, and look at Vatican II and papal pronouncements on Islam, where they say that the Muslims worship the one true God. I believe that. Uh, Well, see, that's wrong. The Quran tells us that the Trinity is false. They deny the divinity of Christ, and they deny the Holy Ghost. So their God's a different God than ours. So their God, which they call Allah, is not God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Therefore, we worship different gods. Well, we believe we worship the true God, therefore they worship a false God. And therefore Vatican II is wrong on that statement. And so are uh, Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and now Francis. But do you not agree that God is a mystery and that you yourself don't even know everything about God? And not only do you not know everything about God, there are things that you think you know about God that you're wrong, and yet you still worship that God. I like to think of it as an apprehension. You apprehend this God the same way you would apprehend something magnificent like the ocean. You may come into contact with it and you may appreciate it without having plumbed all of its depths. And you may have some misconceptions about the ocean, but you can still say, I've touched it and it's made me wet. So I think that the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians all apprehend the same God, but they're just, they haven't come to the fullness of the understanding of some of these essential truths about the nature of God, that he's a trinity, that the second person incarnated and so on and so forth. Do you not understand that sort of perspective? Okay, they may have an apprehension of God, but part of it's wrong. We need to acknowledge that because scripture is clear. Somewhere it says all the gods of the Gentiles are devils. The reason I'm comfortable with all of the monotheistic religions and that they do worship my God is because they have that philosophical understanding that everything in the material universe and even the immaterial spirit world was created out of nothing by God. To me, that is the core and essential distinction between the God of monotheism and any of the other gods of the other religions. Do you not see what I see there? I see. Okay, what you're saying is the monotheistic religions all have a proper concept of God created everything out of nothing. It's okay. Yes, you're right about God creating everything. He has revealed himself to us over here, whereas you believe he's revealed himself over there. Okay? That's where the problem is. Do you have friends and family that are not Catholic? And what's the relationship like with them? Oh, well, that's where I was last week, was visiting family, which, uh, and I do have friends as well. And they know where I stand. If you have an objection to that and you don't want to be my friend, that's fine. I will talk about spiritual points when there's an opening and try to tailor it to their level of understanding. Can you talk a little bit about the enemies of your papacy and the enemies of the Catholic Church? Uh, Who are they? How do they manifest their hatred of Christ? I really don't focus on the enemies of the faith. I mean, I know they're out there, but... Only if I come up face to face with an enemy will I deal with it. Because I don't have time to waste on enemies any more than I have time to waste on useless discussions with people that go nowhere. Yeah. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about private revelation in terms of apparitions of Our Lady? 
uh, and maybe some prophecy concerning the 20th and 21st centuries. I know Our Lady of Good Success talked a lot about the 20th century. Maybe Fatima had something to say about our times. I don't know. I'm no expert, but does anything come to mind? Oh, yes. There's a lot on private revelation. And there is a segment of traditionalism that's usually amongst the lay people. The priests and bishops are not usually involved in focusing on private revelations. Uh, although, if you look up Archbishop Lefebvre's uh, sermon when he consecrated the four bishops, he quotes from Our Lady of Good Success. He quotes from the alleged secret of La Salette. And I say alleged, that actually has been placed on the index of forbidden books. And the public part is approved, but it's this alleged secret, which came from Melanie later on. And in fact, that's something that does need to be addressed because there's a there's a large group of people who quote often, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of Antichrist. Uh, you wouldn't have heard that from any of your St. Evacontos priests or bishops. They wouldn't quote that. Lefebvre quoted that in his sermon, though. It, that's a fascinating read. Well, we know about the secret loss that Melanie asked about two things, Antichrist and infallibility. Well, the alleged third, uh, secret loss at that doesn't have anything about infallibility. I said, okay, I can throw it out right there. Because it doesn't discuss the one thing she asked about when she was writing it down to send to Pope Pius IX. Pope Pius IX said, unless you do penance, you shall all likewise perish. And that's all you need to know about the secret of La Salette. So we can leave it there. See, people are looking for any clue as to how can we get out of this mess, anything to help us sort it out. So they look at private revelations while ignoring sacred scripture. If they look at sacred scripture and the fathers of the church, they would find out the traditionalist movement's wrong. Henry Edward Cardinal Manning, who lived around the time of the First Vatican Council, gave a series of four talks which are compiled in the book, Present Christ of the Holy See. Well, in the fourth talk, he said, all of the fathers of the church tell us that at the time of Antichrist, the holy sacrifice of the Mass will cease completely. Nobody talks about that. They'll talk about Our Lady of Good Success, and I, I do. I like that message. It's a very good message. I think I've compiled six or seven private revelations that point to the last half of the 20th century as being a time of crisis. And looking at what actually happened, that's my opinion. So in other words, that part of their private revelations appears to have been fulfilled. But private revelation... We don't have to believe any of it. We don't have to believe anything comes from Fatima. The church has declared there's nothing contrary to faith and morals, and that, you know, something did happen there. But that's when you get to the third secret, which I don't think we'll ever see. I think that uh, what came out of the Vatican is a fraud. When it came out, yeah, out of curiosity, I did read it. Never did think there was anything to it. I think that it may have gone up in smoke. Because John 23rd is supposed to have read it. We'll never know. And if there's anything in there we need to know, God will send that information to us in a manner that we can be certain of. So I'm not worried about private revelation. What do you think about Medjugorje? Because I'm very petrified of that uh, phenomenon. I think it's satanic, but I could be wrong, obviously. Have you looked at it? Do you have any opinion? Uh, what little I've seen on Medjugorje, I tend to agree there's something seriously wrong there. Well, what I've always wondered about was Garabandal. We're in late 50s, early 60s, somewhere along in there. But at one time or another, each one of the Garabandal seers denied the validity of the apparitions. Well, that's good enough for me. But what you had happen about 1950 or so is what I call circuses. It's like Nacita, Wisconsin, Bayside, New York. I've heard about them. There's someone that went to both of them. And there's a lot to question about both of them. But I think the devil brought up these circuses to confuse people. There's a one I think Bishop Williamson's big on is Akita, Japan. And I've read some of the messages. They, they appear pretty decent. But couldn't the devil write something decent as well to confuse people? And so since we draw a line 58, why not just reject all these apparitions after 58? Until all these various questions like who is Pope and What's the true doctrine of the church? All this stuff is settled, and the church can then look into these apparitions if it's even worth bothering with. 
because I don't need apparitions to know the faith. I need the Catholic faith. It's in the Council of the Church, the teachings of the fathers of the Church, the saints, the popes. And we have our catechisms published before 58. Things that give me certain truth. That's what I need. I don't need apparitions. If God needs to tell me something, he will. <laughs> I think all of these things are distractions from ultimately from the devil. Yes, we just need, okay, what does the teaching on marriage? Jesus taught, it's in the scriptures. Okay, everything we need to know is clear. The fathers of the church are coming right straight down. All we need to do is reaffirm the truth. Now, the matter with um, Francis permitting divorced people to receive Holy Communion, this is a matter of doctrine. There's some in his own church, including priests, bishops, and I think even cardinal, have discussed the possibility, what do we do if he holds to this heresy? Because he's departing from the Catholic faith. I mean, we're taught in seminary. You cannot give Holy Communion to a notorious public sinner. Okay, someone who's divorced and remarried, we believe they're in a bad, they're not in a marriage. Because this, this is the marriage over here. So they're publicly living in sin. We can't give them Holy Communion. What if they live like brother and sister? Is that okay? Uh, this is when they have to submit to the authority of the church and get permission to live that way. It has to be made known, yes, they have come to the church, and the church has come to an accommodation, explained to them, this is what you can do, and this is what you can't do, and they've agreed to abide by the rules of the church. But that's why we have annulments, because an annulment is not dissolving a marriage. It's declaring a marriage never took place. And there was some defect, and the, they're listed in the Code of Canon Law. Look, if you um, believe you're marrying a rich woman, and you find out she's a pauper, Okay, misrepresent herself. That's fraud. That could invalidate if you married her because she is a rich woman. But it's a very rigorous process because we have to be certain no marriage occurred. And then an annulment can be given. And that's there's been some laxity on the granting of annulments. And if you read some of the books written by people, they say, well, it was legally a marriage, but not sacramentally. Well, the church teaching is clear. The marriage between two baptized persons is a sacrament, and you can't separate the two, which is what people are trying to do to soften things. Okay, there are consequences. Yes, the children are technically illegitimate. Okay, we're not going to hold that over their head, but it is a technical matter, and we have to admit that. See, sometimes in our lives there are hard sayings. What Jesus say in, in John chapter 6, after he told them, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, I have life everlasting. Did he run after him and say, no, I want to soften it. No, he turned to the apostles. You going to? Have you ever, in your younger days, have you ever strayed from the Catholic faith? No, I never strayed from the Catholic faith. I have been deceived in being the wrong position, like when I was with Society of St. Pius X for a while. Did not realize their position was wrong. But no, I never willfully heard from So just to wrap up the show, what would you say to anyone that might be out there listening today? The main message of the apocalypse is that God wins in the end and his church wins in the end. In fact, St. John Hughes reports that all the fathers of the church are in agreement that after the death of Antichrist, the whole world will convert and become Catholic. And what's more hopeful than that? When we're all striving to do God's will and we're all on the same page, when we're all in agreement on the important things, such as the matters of faith, just think what a wonderful world that will be.